great to have Oz Guinness on the podcast today. And uh, I'll just admit it, and Dr. Oz Guinness, is, it's a name that I've been familiar with for a number of years. And th always thought to myself, hey, I, I want to bring him on the podcast at one point. And then when the opportunity came up, I was like, okay, let's do it. And so I'm super excited. Yeah, just meeting him backstage, uh, back in the green room, you know. That's right. Uh, I, was, I was struck uh, by his sense of humor. We were actually just chatting with him. And we asked, we always ask our guests, you know, what's, what's the best? Some people prefer their title. Some people prefer first name. And he uh, encouraged us to use his first name unless we get a little frustrated with him. And then he said he can, we can call him whatever he wants. So oh, yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. Yep. And uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation with him today. Dr. Oz Guinness holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree um, and studied over in Oxford in England. So this is just, he has a fascinating background, actually. Uh, grew up in China, and we'll get into all of that until he was seven years of age. Authored over 30 books. And just as a joke, Dave, I said, hey, if you could just ref or, you know, <laughs> review his previous work before he comes on the podcast, that would be excellent. And so you reviewed all 30, correct? Yeah, well, Ez actually sent me several books to read over the weekend, and I'm like kind of scrambling a, a little bit and then he sent me the text to read all 30 and I was like are we really gonna go through all all of this <laughs> prolific author's writing in one podcast like three minutes per book or something but yeah. uh no seriously uh the Magna Carta of Humanity very interesting yep. and uh very thought-provoking and uh I'm just looking forward to chatting with uh Dr. Guinness today to many of you he'll need no introduction and so let's go ahead and bring him in uh, Dr. Oz Guinness thank you for joining us today well, thanks for having me. This is the age of tweets, so That's you right. should be able to cover all 30 in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Hot takes for two minutes on each one. <laughs> well, okay, let's jump right into it. You hold a Doctor of Philosophy degree, and I love that. And so I'm just curious, in your take, and some people would describe you as a social critic that I've seen on, on your bio, right? And, and we live in an age where science obviously is, is elevated and that we have to, okay, understand things through science, but having a philosophy degree, how has that helped shape the way you understand it and view the world? Actually, my D Phil is just the Oxford's perverse. Everything in Oxford's in Latin. So when an American university invented the PhD, Oxford turned its PhD into English and called it a doctor of philosophy. So I didn't actually study philosophy. I studied sociology, social okay. sciences, but I read a good deal of philosophy. Okay. Uh, the, uh, philosophy is basically good thinking about thinking. That's all it is. Now, the trouble is today we have an idolatry of science, but science never answers the why questions. It only answers the how questions. It does so brilliantly. I'm not against science. But we've got to realize the limitations of science. Yeah. Your background, talk about this. Till age seven, I believe, right? You grew up in China. Is that is that accurate? No, until I was ten. Ten. Okay. Now I was born in China. And mm -hmm. My grandfather went out there at the end of the nineteenth century and survived the Boxer Rebellion. And uh, my parents were born there. I was born there. We first of all lived in north central China where we were surrounded by the Japanese army who killed 17 million in the invasion and the communist army on the other side and the nationalist army. Mm. And we were in a terrible famine in which 5 million died in three months, including my two brothers. And we moved from there, terrible circumstances, to Nanking, as it was then, Nanjing today. So I was there as a seven-year-old in the climax of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, mm. but I was there a couple of years after that too. Yeah. How did that? How did that shape your mindset? I mean, do you still, when you recall back to those days, do you have a lot of memories from that time period? Uh, certainly, of the later time. I obviously didn't remember the time, you know, during the famine. Um, but in the revolution, yes, I, I begin the book by saying I remember the day when my dad turned to me and said, "Son, we're in trouble." Chiang Kai-shek has abandoned the city and we're at the mercy of the Red Army. And then they came. They festooned the streets with loudspeakers and there were trials in the morning, executions in the afternoon. Mm. And my dad one day sort of watching a crowd being moved out, 
he was standing on the city walls, could see that some of those who were marched out were his fellow Christians. And so you not only had a terrible reign of terror in what was the southern capital, you had the beginning of a dreadful persecution. Wow. So I would say it left me with realism, and certainly realism about life, but also realism about Marxism. Mm. But without any fear, I often say, you know, my dad and mom went through hell in those 10 years, in my first 10 years, not from me, but from the circumstances, war, death, destruction, famine, you name it. Mm. But never once did I see them doubting the Lord. And my dad would often say, you know, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Incredible. David, any thoughts? No, I just, I mean, it, clearly when you, when you uh, read uh, the Magna Carta of Humanity, it's, it's, it's quite obvious that you have some, like this, this experience has colored uh, how you view uh, a lot of, a lot of the thoughts you share in the book, but my question actually was more of a personal one. Like after the first 10 years, where did you go from there? Where did your family go? How did you get out? Well, my family's Irish, okay. but in fact, I went back to England and I went to school and then university in England. After my time at London University as an undergraduate, I went to the Labrie community in Switzerland, if you've ever heard of that with Francis Schaeffer. And after that, I went back and did my doctorate at Oxford. But I, I tell the story at the beginning. When I was at Oxford, my tutor was at All Souls, the elite of the elites colleges, no students. And I was at dinner one night with him, and his friend Isaiah Berlin was there, the great Jewish philosopher of freedom. And it turned out as we were talking, I'd been a seven-year-old in the Chinese Revolution, and he'd been a seven-year-old in the Russian yeah. Revolution. Yeah. So both of us experienced the two major revolutions of the last century as seven-year-olds. <laughs> but as we compared notes, we thought, thank God, although he didn't thank God, he was a Jewish atheist, I'm afraid. Thank God the English-speaking people stood up against dictators like Hitler and Stalin and so on. But we would never believe, this is the mid-70s, that America, because it was always considered Americanism, the American dream and so on, was a surrogate for socialism. So you'd never need socialism, let alone radical socialism, let alone cultural Marxism. And yet that's what we're facing today. You talk about the five revolutions. I've heard you mention this. So the English Revolution, 1642, uh, American 1776, French 1789, Russian 17, or 1917, Chinese 1949. How are those revolutions different? Well, the first two English ones are often described as different because the English failed. It's called the last cause. The American succeeded. It was the winning cause. But in fact, both of those are very close in the sense that they both came through the Reformation from the Hebrew Scriptures and above all from Exodus and Deuteronomy. Whereas the French, the Russian and the Chinese are expressly anti-Christian, anti-biblical, and anti-religious. As you know, great thinkers like Alexander Solzhenitsyn <clears throat> would say that the hostility, the animosity to God, you see first in the French Revolution, mm -hmm. is at the heart of the radical left and more central even than their politics and economics. And of course, we're seeing that in America today. Mm. So you, you kind of have this set up in your book. You talk about... Uh, Sinai versus Paris, 1776 uh, versus 1789. Um, and you talk a lot about ordered freedom. How do you respond to somebody? Well, I'm thinking of somebody in our audience, and I've had these conversations, especially with younger students, who, who as you pointed out in your book, which I thought, I mean, you're, the fact that you pointed it out was great. Um, but here we have this document um, that talks about the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Uh, we're endowed by our creator, uh, certain unalienable rights, and yet it, it didn't seem that that was across the board for everybody. We didn't live up to our ideals. And so 
there seems to be a perspective, and I'm not sure it's a terrible one. Um, if you look at the early church, their attitudes seem to kind of be, hey, you know, Caesar's going to Caesar, Jesus is Lord, and they just kind of they went at it and seemed to be relatively unconcerned maybe with politics until... I'm, I'm painting with a super broad brush, okay? Very broad. Well, Very you, broad. Come back to that. The, yeah, the, talk, the, talk to me. That's a huge different subject. Very important, because I think a lot of people are wrong on that today. But let's go back. There's no question that slavery, the treatment of the Native Americans, is the great evil at the heart of the American experiment. It's a contradiction. It's a hypocrisy. It was wrong. Yeah. Now, remember, the ideals were right. See, you're someone like Martin Luther King, who believed in the Declaration. And he said the Declaration was a promissory note, mm -hmm. but it wasn't cashed in. He didn't reject the system. He rejected the contradiction and the evil, whereas the mm -hmm. radicals today reject the whole system. This is important. Mm -hmm. You remember in the very beginning, Wilberforce, our yep. great Christian brother, he yep. pleaded with Jefferson first in the State Department, then later with James Monroe as president, join a concert of benevolence, as he called it, to tackle slavery. They didn't. Or you have Samuel Johnson, the great dictionary writer. He said, how come that those who are yelping about freedom, this are his words, are the drivers of Negroes. I'm quoting him. In other words, a, a, an ocean away, the horror of the contradiction was obvious. Yeah. And yeah. tragically, they didn't tackle it. Awesome. Yeah. But remember, chapter three of the Bible has the first sin. Yeah. God created human beings free, and the first major thing they did was misuse it. And tragically, you have that, but you don't throw out the Bible. Hmm. You see the best and the worst, and you tackle the worst in the light of the best. When you look at the last two years, okay, so I know your book specifically references uh, America. A um, number in our audience are from Canada and then and then mm -hmm. other places as well. And what's kind of interesting, I'm curious to get your perspective, right, from living over in England for a number of years, right? I would often say living in Canada that it kind of, as a very general statement, where um, Canada is today, kind of Britain already, you know, has been there. And then if, you know, then the States might be there eventually, it's kind of, you see America and then Canada and then Britain, it feels like there's this mm -hmm. shift. Um, how do you view that landscape? Well, I do follow the difference in Canada and the US, like Seymour Martin Lipset outlined it very much. They're very, very different because obviously Canada was built by many of the loyalists to the crown mm -hmm. who went north and the others, the rebels stayed down here. Now, remember, I'm European. I'm not American. Right. After 30 years here, I am not American. So I'm European, Anglo-Irish, and very proud to be. But you remember Macron, Prime Minister of uh, President of France, mm -hmm. he said to the French, beware of these ideas in American universities. I thought that's ironic because these ideas, which are extreme here, are actually French ideas yeah. developed and become flourishing here as they haven't been in Europe. But Europe and Canada and the U.S. are all in certain ways facing the same challenge. There's an aggressive secularism. There are views of cultural Marxism and so on. So we've got to watch what's happening in each other's countries and resist what's really dangerous to the gospel because so much that's dangerous to the gospel is dangerous to humanity and mm -hmm. to freedom and to justice. Mm -hmm. When you look at the difference between 1776, 1789, um, why did you land on that comparison as you view society today, especially in America? Well, there are, you know, I've been at a think tank here in Washington, D.C. I know there are other explanations. Everyone talks about the grand polarization, yeah. this deep, deep division. Why? Is it the social media? Is it responses to dear old Trump? Is it the coastals, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, against the heartlanders in the Midwest and the South? Is it the populists, you know, Hillary Clinton's deplorables, over against the George Soros borderless world globalist types? Now, all those things 
and others have a part to play. But as I've analyzed it, you look at postmodernism, radical multiculturalism, identity politics, uh, tribal politics, the sexual revolution itself, go on down the line. All those trends, those radical movements, owe nothing to the American Revolution and everything to ideas coming from cultural Marxism and postmodernism. In other words, they don't come from today's Paris because the French Revolution only lasted 10 years. And then came Napoleon, dictator, and he said the revolution is completed. So we're not talking about Paris today, but the influence, the lava flows of the French Revolution. It's great stuff. Dave, any thoughts on that? Um, so, yeah, I'm, st I'm still so fascinated uh, about, the, about the previous comments. Um, so you have this system that's essentially built on, I believe you said, in, in the 20th century, these essentially built on secular governments, right? So you had um, China and Russia as well com completely secularized. Is that, is that um, this is a product directly of 1789 in your mind, correct? Um, well, let's go back to right. secularism itself, which is wider than the cultural Marxism we're talking about. There have always been atheists. As you know, there are atheists in the Bible. Psalm mm -hmm. 14, 1, the fool... Yes says yeah. in his heart there's no god atheism isn't new lucretius etc etc but a continent-sized aggressive anti-christian anti-religious secularism is new and it's european and there are three impulses put very quickly i don't want god i don't need god and I can replace God. Now, I don't want God is the heart of the animosity. And that does go back to the French Revolution. So you have, say, Diderot and his famous cry, we will never be free until we strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest. In priest, other words, yeah. throne and altar, church and state were one, oppressive and corrupt. So the revolution threw off both. And you have this militant animosity in the radical left ever since. Now, I, I call that the Catholic era or impulse because it was the terrible corruptions of the Catholic state churches which caused the worst of it. The Protestant impulse, we don't need God. It was the Protestant countries through the Reformation again, which became prosperous and powerful, Britain, Germany, Switzerland, Holland, and so on. And people thought, we can do very well without God. And of course, you have that in the Bible. When you build houses, you think you've done yep. it all yourself. The new one, and that's much more recent, the last 50 years, we can replace God. You think of Yuval Harari, Homo Deus. Right. We can be God with biogenetics and so on. So put those three together. But the deepest is we do not want God. So I would say if you look at secularism, it's a parasite on our best. In other words, they believe all the things we do without the Lord. Mm. Progress, but no heaven, and so on. It's a parasite in our best, but here's the sting. It's a protest against our worst. And that's mm -hmm. where it ties in again with America <clears throat> now. America, through the genius of the First Amendment, has never had an aggressive secularism until recently. And the excesses of the religious right have inspired a new American animosity and a rejection through the sexual revolution of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, which is incredibly fateful. So we are producing our own greatest opposition by our follies and by the way we've stained the name of the Lord. Mm. So how do, so my question would be um, somebody that wants to be a, uh, a faithful leader within Christian circles, a pastor, a teacher, or just a, somebody who is a called out one in the culture. How do you, how do you speak about these things, Oz, in a way that doesn't minimize? So, like, if I'm trying to find common ground with somebody that's very f frustrated with hypocrisy within the church or something like that, how do we find common ground to say, "Hey, that wasn't right," but also? Uh, like, like like what you did with the founding documents, like, hey, we didn't live up to our ideals here, but these are still some 
good statements? How do, how do we dialogue with people that maybe even that I would say have quite a bit of animosity towards anything uh, a Christian, sadly, because of Christians? Well, if you don't have animosity, which a lot of people do, people have suspicion. And as you know, the essence of postmodernism, there's no God, there's no truth. So everything's power. So behind everything, including conversations, is a power agenda. And you develop what the scholars call the hermeneutics of suspicion. In other words, you need to suspect everyone to really see where they're coming from. So the younger generation talks about authenticity and a hatred of hypocrisy. But that idea of authenticity without truth is meaningless. And for people who really want the best school and way of countering hypocrisy, there's nothing like Jesus. Mm -hmm. No one in all human history was tougher on hypocrites than Jesus. And you can see the answers there. So when you talked about someone, Dave, being called out, mm -hmm. all followers of Jesus are called out. That's what it means to be a follower. Starting with Abraham, you know, the first word, as the rabbis say, to Abraham was negative. Leave. Yeah. The break with your country, culture, and kin, because God in Abraham and then for us through Jesus is beginning a new way, a new mission that's to be decisively different. So we've got to see where the worldliness is so wrong and where God's new way is so right and then commit ourselves to that even if we feel we're the only ones left doing so, although there are 7,000 and a lot more than that, who haven't bowed the knee to bail. The trend is see... people who just see the problems, wring their hands, and then join the defectors. No, we should join the real thing. Mm. You mentioned, I was just looking for the quote, and I can't quite uh, pull it up here. I know I highlighted it somewhere, but basically, that a lot of times we look back, okay, we look back and we say, uh, while well, these founding fathers, right, they were so evil because how could you allow slaves, right? And you, as you mentioned, that that was evil. But a lot of times, um, I feel like we point backwards and we um, we think a lot about how people 30 years ago, right, how they are parents' generation or grandparents' generation failed. And in the midst of that, I think sometimes we fail to see our own shortcomings. Is that, you talk about this a little bit in your book, but why did you go there? How have you, you well, seen that play out? You know, humility means that if we can see the sins of the past, we should be aware that the future generations will see ours. And yeah. things that we take as self-evident are not. They're just 21st century or whatever. Things we take as Christian are not. They're American or Western or whatever it is. In other words, the future will judge us the way we see the past. Now, mercifully, the Lord will judge us all, but he is the most merciful. But there's an incredible lack of realism today. So a feature of the radical left, the whole cultural Marxist approach, is its total lack of mercy. And, of course, that goes back to the French Revolution. You know, the English-speaking idea, you're innocent until proven guilty. Not in France. As soon as you are charged, you are guilty, off into the tumbrils and down to the guillotine. And, of course, that spirit lives today. As Douglas Murray, his book, The Dangerous Madness of Crowds, you know, he points out as an atheist, <clears throat> that's the feature of the left. Cancel them. Censor them. Pull down the statue. And so on. Well, that's absolutely merciless. Now, you compare that with the gospel. Things like confession and forgiveness and reconciliation all have freedom at their heart. So put it this way, as, as, as someone's put it, when wrongs are done, and they've been terrible in America, what happens? Well, you've got three options. First, you let them accumulate, undealt with, but that's unlivable. The wrongs pile up, action, reaction, a kind of Corsican blood feud on a grand level, unlivable, just accumulation. Or the second approach, which is the history's main approach, is abasement or appeasement. You're not removing the things, but 
you're too strong for me, so I will appease you by all sorts of excuses or giving you something or showing that I'm weaker than you, abasement or appeasement. And of course, that's the notion of sacrifice in the pagan world and so on. The third option is genuinely atonement. In other words, a way of dealing with the wrong to bring the parties at one together again. And that's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur in the Old Testament, and of course, the cross and Calvary for us as followers of Jesus in the new. Now, if you see that, this is incredible. Let's put it slowly. That is where America's greatest evil, slavery and racism, is meeting the radical left's greatest fraud but it should be meeting the gospel's greatest glory and strength. Wow. So this isn't just personal forgiveness. This should be national public forgiveness. We've got to make it so. Uh, from a practical standpoint, Oz, how would you, how would you say that moves forward? One of the, one of the things I was, I was uh, reading uh, through your, your book this morning and uh, one of the headings, uh, all for one and one for all. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, that, that sounds pretty nice. Um, but as you pointed out, we had Genesis 3. We had a fall. All of us are turned to our own way. And so, as I understand it, there has to be more than a, we need to teach people how to look out for one another better. I, I kind of have a hopelessness that that would happen because... People, I mean, just coming through this pandemic, what happens? People say, oh, you know, we're, we're going to be running out of toilet paper. Everyone goes and runs out and grabs toilet paper because they're self-centered. There, there's definitely not this all for one, one for all naturally. It's actually quite the opposite. So are you advocating for some sort of system where there's enough, enough Christians that kind of make things a little better and everyone's a little nicer to one another well, the root's not, or are you essentially saying, like, we need a national revival where people turn to the Lord? I don't, that sounds very reductionistic. I, I, it was also a terrible question, but do you understand what I'm asking? <laughs> I do, yes, Dave. But let me go back to what you said earlier about the early church. Yes. You know, a lot of Americans say, well, like the early church, I'm keeping my head down. I'm faithful to the Lord. I won't mm -hmm. bow to Caesar. I'm just keeping my head down and being faithful. They don't realize what they're saying. The early church had zero public responsibility or zero liberty to make any difference. They were under Caesar. But the American system, remember it comes out of the, through the Reformation, out of the Bible. Sure. Yeah. Now, let's look more historically. When the church became the official religion of Rome, 380, under the Emperor Theodosius, Con the church made a bad mistake. It copied mm. Roman structures. Yep. Roman structures were hierarchical. They weren't biblical. You had the Caesar, consuls, the senators, and so on. Yep. And you had the pope, the cardinals, the bishops, and so on. Well, hierarchical structures are based on power, and they were corrupted. Think the Inquisition and all sorts of horrors. The Reformation, not immediately, but slowly, went back to the Bible. And the Bible doesn't have hierarchical structures. They're covenantal. So you look at Calvin, Zwingli, Bullinger, Knox, Cromwell, the Mayflower Compact, John Winthrop, John Adams, and the first written constitution in America, Massachusetts. They're talking covenant. Now, one of the features of covenant, I got more of it in the book, one of the features of covenant is yeah. the reciprocal responsibility of everyone for everyone. Yep. You quoted the three musketeers. They were the 17th mm -hmm. century. Yep. But we're talking about thousands of years before that. And this isn't a way of being nice. This is God's new way of ordered freedom and reciprocal responsibility. So you, the famous results of that, you love your neighbor, you finish it as yourself. Yeah, as, you, as yourself. Yeah. You love the stranger because <clears throat> you were strangers. And then, of course... You have a special responsibility for those who don't have a voice and who can't stand up for themselves, the widows, the orphans, and so on. In other words, you have a view of reciprocal responsibility. 
Now that means, all right, you quoted the three musketeers, all for one, one for all. Yeah. But for the Jews, they said early on, every Jew is responsible for every Jew. Now, that comes in the U.S. Constitution, we the people. But it should mean, although we've lost it, every American is responsible for America and for every American. In other words, in a covenantal constitutional society, there's a collective responsibility for the whole. And so Christians who say, I'll be like the early church, keep my head down, they are faithless, both in terms of being salt and light in the freedom they have, but also in terms of the system they have which is not living under a Roman Caesar, but living under a somewhat secularized version of what was a Jewish covenant. Yeah. So we have a lot of stake in that. But the first thing, we've got to get Christians to understand it. I'm yeah. amazed. I mean, I was at a, you know, I won't mention places, but so few of the churches I go to understand that constitution comes from covenant. The consent of the governed comes from Exodus. The separation of powers comes from Exodus and Deuteronomy. And now the system was once rooted in biblical ideas. It's not just that most of them in the early days were Christian. Now, it's certain we've got to be very careful here because immediately our Jewish friends think of Christian America. Yeah. And that reminds them of state churches in Europe where they were terribly persecuted. We're yeah. not talking about this isn't Christian America because the First Amendment. There is no established religion. No. But the system owes everything to Jewish and Christian ideas. And we should be the guardians of that. Not because it was there in the past, but because it's God's best way of dealing with it. No. I so, would, as, can I ask, can I follow no. up, as? So uh, you, you, follow, uh, you mentioned loving your neighbor, uh, quoting Leviticus 19.18. Um, I, I under... That only works, though, if everyone, like, as you pointed out, I think it was, it might have been the first chapter after the intro. Yeah, everything starts with a concept of authority. Like, if the people are not living under God's authority, we can have a great system that is built on biblical principles, even from the Hebrew Bible all the way through, but I don't, I would say that that system only has a faint echo of God's perfect reign that... Um, no. is going to be realized again, right? I mean, I mean, of course, of course. But remember, the scandal of the American church compared with Canada or France or Germany or Britain, we're a huge majority here. Yeah. Now you take, say, other groups. I, I love the Jewish people, stand up for them all the time. They are 2% of America, <clears throat> no more. But they punch well above their weight intellectually financially culturally all power to them we're a majority we're the biggest community and we are called to be salt and light but we're not salty we're not light bearing hmm. we are the problem what does so, it look like yeah, to be salt and light well you take that notion what is justice in the old testament it's where the people made in the image of god are treating other people made in the image of God properly, yep. with honesty, with fairness, with respect, and so on. So, for example, words. The Old Testament has a notion of evil speech. Christians supported a president, many of whose policies I personally agree with. I'm not a citizen, but I did. Mm -hmm. But his tweets, his insults, his bullying were evil speech. Yeah. And you know the rabbis call that tantamount to murder. Yep. And many Christians on the social media, their casualness about truth and their disrespect for people they disagree with is appalling. It's unbiblical. It's anti-biblical. And when we don't live Christianly, we dishonor the name of the Lord. Amen. So we can pray, hallowed be your name. But we're besmirching his name unless we're living the way he calls us to. Wonderful. So we just, have the problem. Just to tack on to what you said, Dave, I mean, as I think a lot of people that might read your book, one of the questions that might come, if they're coming from my perspective, is, okay, well, why not go to Christ? Why go to Sinai, right? Why, why not go to Christ as the perfect example? And along with that, 
Um, why is the relationship, uh, I guess a lot of times I feel like people will say, okay, well, America is almost an extension of Israel. And I feel like this goes back to uh, an old covenant mindset, right? And so I'm curious to get your perspective on it when well, obviously we, ha we have Jesus. And so how do you, how do you reconcile that, that challenge? Um, we'll keep the two separately, uh, Ezra, because they're, they're big questions yeah. and very important questions. And you had a famous pastor of a mega church, who shall be unnamed, who called us a couple of years ago to unhitch our yeah. faith yeah. Right. from the Old Testament. That's disastrous. Wow. The yeah. Lord would do it. <laughs> our Lord as the Messiah was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And That's the fact is, the Old Testament gives us so much of the foundations. Now, of course, it's fulfilled finally in Jesus. But if the Catholics made a huge mistake in copying Roman structures, we've made an equal mistake in the evangelical world. We've read Exodus. Most of us have not unhitched it, thank goodness. But many have uh, done this, that they've personalized it and spiritualized mm. it. So Exodus, magnificent stuff. It, it's a foretaste of my salvation your salvation. In other words, it's purely a personal liberation. No, Exodus is social and political. And when I talk about human beings made in the image of God, or the absolute importance of truth, or the importance of words, American life needs to be reformed in terms of how we speak. American speech is rotten absolutely rotten American public speech. And we've got to reform it. And we reform it in the light of the truths of the Old Testament, which, of course, are fulfilled in the New. So freedom, you know, our Lord says a lot about freedom. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, and so on. And so Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set you free. But many Christians the, see freedom as purely a luxury yeah. issue that may be political or whatever, they don't tie it together in the deeply biblical way. We've got to bring the New Testament and the Old back together and see the Old as magnificent foundations. Oh, I we love it, 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 do without them. Well, and if we don't do that, I feel like we pick up the Old Testament and we say, well, what in the world was God doing? So one of the people that's influenced my writing and thinking on this, Christopher Wright, The Mission of God, mm -hmm. and just the importance of that. And then we're, a couple of weeks, we have John Walton coming on the podcast as well. I think he's a proponent of Emmanuel theology. You know, God goes to where his, his people are at and God works with where his people are at. But I'm curious to get your take on this. I feel like a lot of modern day Christians, they will be so quick to say, okay, let's just get to Jesus, right? And obviously that's important, right? Let's get to Jesus. But without understanding how the parts of the Old Testament relate to Jesus, I feel like we really miss, in large respects, what he came to do. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely. I said earlier that yeah. Abraham is the beginning of God's new way. You know, so you see in the proto-history, the prehistory of humanity, in Genesis 1 to 11, you see what Reinhold Niebuhr calls the bookends. Hmm. Authoritarianism on one end, anarchy in the other. And the way of the Lord, a family first, and then a nation, and then finally our Lord bringing it to the world, you see what I call the ordered freedom of Sinai. And this is incredibly important. It's a covenantal freedom. Mm -hmm. So the big difference, between, well, there are many differences. One is, though, that we talk about freedom. We have to say we're created to be free. We're called to be free, as Paul says. But we are only free when we're set free to be free and that of course is what our lord gives us in the most powerful way of all but we must not just make it purely personal and purely spiritual mm -hmm. yes i love that i love that idea because if you look right right after the the, the verse you quote in the galatians only do not use your freedom so i mm -hmm. love i love your the 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 line for me from the the book that just keeps coming back oh, ordered freedom and then seeking the highest good of another person does not necessarily mean me and Jesus doing our thing, or even in culturally, because I mean, God saved uh, Acts two. God saves three thousand individuals. They were added to this day three thousand souls. So it's not like 
people or individuals don't matter, but the very next verses start talking about what the community is doing. We save these individuals into a community. God has a people group, and I think the neglect of thinking about... Um, there, there is a tension, right, between the individual freedom and also seeking the highest good of another person, right? There's this communal mm-hmm. thing going on and also this individual thing. Is that Does that sound... I'm thinking no, out loud a little bit. Yeah. And one of the places where, uh, let's say, our evangelicalism is dead right is its focus on the heart. Yeah. And, you know, the Jews say that one of the biggest scandals Christians commit is saying that the Christian faith is about love and Judaism is about the law. Mm. You have love right at the beginning. Here, O Israel, you love Shema, the yeah. God, yes. the Lord, the hearts, and so on. And you can see that there's a great stress even there in the heart. So in the great passage where it says you have to choose, Moses says, you know, blessing and curse, death and life, choose life. You have the little words halfway through that. But if your heart turns away, no, it's not purely external, it's internal. Now, of course, that's always the problem. The hearts turn away. Now, we have kept that alive with the notion of inviting Jesus into your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock and so on. But we've made it purely personal and lost the implications for the whole of life. But that's that's actually wonderful. God does, I'm quoting Roger Williams, God does not rape the conscience or invade the heart. He's made us free. That's an incredible Mm. thought. We have the only grounds for freedom, Jews and Christians. Mm. Atheists don't. The pagans didn't. They can't ground freedom. We can. Mm. One of the reasons I wanted to bring you on was I think there's a lot of Christians my age that are really fed up. Okay, let's go back simply uh, 2016, right? You mentioned the tweets and all this stuff. And a lot of Christians my age became fed up with what they would term Christian nationalism, right? So religious right leaders coming out of the moral majority kind of attaching themselves and saying, okay, we have morals. And then all of a sudden really pushing a leader that many would view as, as corrupt. That's, and that's just a reality. And, and a lot would say, okay, I want nothing to do with the system. Let's keep God and politics absolutely separate. Right. And there's a part of me, I'll just be honest, that is very attracted to that. But for the last several years, I've had a chance to work with different leaders in government who have made positive impacts and it's been very um, encouraging to watch. And so I'm curious to get your perspective from years and decades of different, uh, living in different cultures. Yeah, I feel like sometimes people outside the US, Canadians, right, and, and others, there can be an eagerness to criticize the American church. But as you mentioned earlier, one of the differences with the American church is it, it, you do live in a majority. And that's a totally different way of thinking than when you're in a Um, when you're in a land where Christianity is very much a minority. And so talk about those two mindsets and how Christians in America, like of my generation, should think. Well, there's a huge amount of shallowness, worldliness, hypocrisy, you name it, in the church. But do we leave the church or do we pray for revival? You know, Mm. there are lies and rumors and myths and all sorts of things. Do we abandon the truth or do we go the way of everything's a lie? No, I say we stick with the truth, even if there's a sense hardly anyone around us at all. And there's no question, the church in America needs revival or it will soon, rather quickly in decades, become like the church in Canada. But the church in Canada was once much stronger and the church in Britain was much stronger. And it's to their shame that they have become so weak by worldliness and unfaithfulness and lack of leadership and so on. Now, the challenge to the American church is still numerically powerful. But can we see the Lord reviving and reforming and awakening so that it doesn't go the way of the other? Because we're at a, let's let's be honest, we're at a civilizational moment. Mm -hmm. You know, we're towards the end of the West because it's a cut flower unless there's a genuine awakening. I don't mean some cultural movement. I mean the real thing. The same is true in America and in Canada and and Britain too. We're at a civilizational moment. But the issue for young Christians, is the Christian faith true? If it's true, 
it would be true if that particular believer is the only person in the world left who believes it. And if it's false, it would be false if the entire world, except for that one person, believed it. In other words, the question is, is it true? And there's so much shallow thinking. Yes, I'm disgusted. I may be much, much older than you guys or mm -hmm. the teenagers, certainly. But I'm as disgusted and lament or angry at things I see. But it drives us back closer to the Lord. One, because he's true. But two, because the alternatives are bankrupt. Yeah. yeah. So as we look at the chaos in America, the only way forward, not just for America, but for humanity, are these magnificent truths in Scripture, the Old as well as the New Testament. I, w I, w I saw a quote, I think it was uh, John Gray in your book, correct? If you remember, correct me, but he, he yep. kind of made a, a comment about uh, something, Gnosticism is the faith of the people. When I saw that, I was just like... Um, I was thinking about Jim Dennison, actually, yes, but it's kind of like, hey, we're, we're back to where we started. There's nothing new under the sun. Gnosticism, like, you know, a lot of the New Testament, some of the New Testament writings sort of combating some of that ideology and just thinking about the, the ancient creeds of the church, I, I, the, the mushiness that seems to be a part of church culture is something that, as someone who actually works in a Christian college setting, like, I, I really want to press these unchanging, basic, fundamental truths onto my students because I feel like we're in an age that seems like everything is up for grabs and everything's cool until you say, no, 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 no. I actually believe that a, a virgin-born God came in the flesh and he died, and he made a single atonement for sins, and then he rose from the dead. Like, very specific mm -hmm. um, Christian belief is is either greeted with scorn or, uh, like, animosity, as we said earlier. And, but I think that's mm -hmm. where the real battle is. And I think for the Church, yes, we need to be engaged in politics. Yes, we need to advocate. Like, I think it's good to take care of unwanted people in society, whether that's, you know, through advocacy for a pro-life movement, but I, I want a full-orbed one as well, right? So, but I think it, it starts and ends for me, first and foremost, with those things you could put on a note card almost. Does that... Absolutely. But you have in the Bible, you take, say, Joshua, choose today whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But he gives them that choice and drives them to see it. Or you take a much more dire time, like Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he's virtually against everyone in the establishment, 850 prophets and the royal house, and the people are sitting on the fence. And he says, if Baal is God, choose Baal. Follow Baal. Now that's daring. We've got to do something in that today. All right, things are wrong. You choose. Is the Christian faith true? Is Jesus his Lord? In which case it means X, Y, and Z. If not, go out. Secularism, whatever it is. And push people to see that choice. But of course, as our Lord said, you're going to leave me? To whom should we go, Lord? Yeah. The alternatives to faith in Jesus today are literally bankrupt. And so we're talking about the secret way forward, the open way forward for humanity. Which yeah. is terrific. We've got to get Christians off the back foot, demoralized, discouraged, seeing they are the champions and guardians of the best for tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Last I, question for you, and then we want to respect your time here. Um, what do you want people to take away from your book after they read it? Well, a number of simple things. First, what's the deepest diagnosis? Very few people go to the roots of the problem. That's one thing, and I hope I've done that, trying to describe what the radical left is. Secondly, though, we can't just lament the darkness, the constructive alternative. I've tried to show chapters lay on the Constitution or on transmission, how the Bible has so much practical teaching for how we go forward positively. So I would hope people are able to engage the crisis much more seriously, but with a way that is confident mm. on the front foot, realizing, as I said, that we are the champions and defenders 
of the best for humanity tomorrow. And things aren't going to get easier. You look at the rise of China or the emergence of, say, singularity. You talked of Gnosticism. We haven't mm. seen anything like the Gnosticism we're about to produce with our mm. super ultra intelligence and these frail old bodies as bad as ever. So body bad, mind good, and all sorts of things are coming. Yeah. I mean, on the verge of an extraordinary time, which only the younger mm. generation will really see. But nothing like the good news of the gospel. Truly, it's the best news ever. And we've got to capture that confidence. Amen. Love it. Dr. Osganis, thank you for joining us today. Um, and I hope for those of you that have watched, listen to this, that if anything, this makes you think. Uh, go out, mm. certainly purchase his book, uh, The Magna Carta yes. for Humanity. Um, just, just uh, or Magna Carta of Humanity, just a, just a fantastic read. And uh, I, I hope that, you know, in the things that we've talked about, you know, the Old Testament, New, New Testament, that this really encourages you to not just say, okay, hey, what is the Bible saying to me in this moment, right? But actually think of what is God doing throughout human history? Yes. And um, thank you, Dr. Oz, for uh, coming on and uh, sharing with us today. My privilege. Thank you. Thank you.